Now it's time for our last stop and jot. Make sure to grab your Module 6 handout and let's get started. Since our last stop and jot, we covered two big areas, instructional practices and strategies and assessment. There are so many skills involved in the teaching of phonics that it would have been impossible to provide suggested strategies for every decoding, encoding, and word study skill. So instead, in the lesson on instructional practices and strategies, we focused on the broader overarching practices of phonics, alphabet knowledge, blending, segmenting, and irregular words. Alphabet knowledge refers to one's understanding of letters, their names, sequence, formation, shape, and sounds. Our language is based on sounds and the letters that represent them. So it is crucial that we teach these skills with intent and provide lots of opportunities for students to engage in activities that draw their attention to their names, shapes, and sounds. Blending is a major aspect of decoding and encoding. It begins with seeing letters in a word, assigning sounds, and blending the sounds together to pronounce the words. This begins orally with just hearing sounds and blending them together to seeing small words and breaking them down by sounds and blending them for pronunciation to decoding big multisyllabic words that still require one to blend chunks of sounds together in an attempt to pronounce that big unknown word. Blending is a practice that we all, even as adults, still have to use when we try to figure out an unknown word. There were three strategies shared to provide practice with blending. A new strategy called blending lines and an old practice of decodable texts. Both strategies are designed to provide blending practice using skills previously taught. The last strategy shared was the rainbow arc which is designed to have students practicing their blending skills while learning a new skill or pattern. This strategy visually shows students the important role vowel sounds play in a word as evidenced by the red vowel letters. And for each word built, having students ask the questions. How many vowels? What are they? Where are they? The second big power skill of phonics is segmenting, which is the opposite of blending. Instead of putting sounds together to form a word, we now pull the sounds we hear in words apart and assign letters to them. Elkhorn in boxes or sound boxes are a wonderful way to help students hold on to the individual sounds they hear in words, especially in the early stages of teaching segmentation. Dictation is a strategy that has been around a long time, but typically as part of a spelling assessment. Now it is being used as a structured practice activity, hearing words, segmenting the sounds, and then writing the letters that correspond with the sounds. This is a quick and easy way for kids to practice segmentation. And when done as a group activity on the floor or around a table with dry erase boards and collaborative conversation, oh my! The last strategy we shared for segmentation is one that comes with more advanced word study. Once students begin working with multisyllabic words, the reason big words are hard for kids to decode, even when they know the syllable patterns and generalizations, is that there are so many letters in a big word that it is hard to know where to look to start thinking about breaking it apart. Spot and dot to the rescue. This strategy visually helps kids to see that vowels are the key to syllables. So you spot the vowels, connect the dots, look at the letters captured in the dot connection, see the pattern inside, and divide. And just in case they forget the syllable division patterns, we can use the word clover to help them remember. C equals closed, L equals C plus L E, O equals open, V equals vowel teams, the talkers and the whiners, E equals final E, and R equals R controlled. The last instructional practice we discussed dealt with irregular words. 
High frequency words, words encountered often in text, have often been also thought of as irregular words, but we know that many high frequency words can be decoded. For this reason, a new term that has somewhat immersed is irregular words. Irregular words are those that are truly irregular, meaning they do not follow the basic rules used when decoding, but there are also temporary irregular words, which are words that can be decoded, but not at this point in a student's development. We are working on it now as a sight word, but just because you haven't yet learned the skills needed to decode it. I love that, and it is a key thing we as teachers need to share with our kids. Another key thing we need to remember is that we shouldn't just try to make kids memorize these words, but instead help them learn them by using the parts that they know to then emphasize the part that is irregular. Part words is a great strategy for doing this as it teaches kids to use what they know about the word and to spotlight the irregular part. Word sorts was the last strategy we talked about, and we got a good laugh about the fact that it didn't really fit under any one decoding or encoding practice because the idea of sorting can be used for almost any skill. This is a great strategy for teaching decoding and spelling patterns, as in the example we discussed during the lesson. But teaching kids to categorize things by comparing and contrasting their characteristics will aid retention of many skills. There is a huge repertoire of strategies available to you through your curriculum and via online resources, so it shouldn't be hard to find activities to reinforce the keys you are teaching. The big takeaway from this lesson is not what you use, but that you provide lots of opportunities for students to work with and talk about the skills being taught. We then moved to our lesson on assessment. This lesson provided a few links that offer assessment materials in specific skill areas of decoding and encoding and general suggestions about ways to use these assessments, but the most important thing we need to hold on to when we think about assessment is that the real reason for taking the time to gather data on what a child knows or doesn't know is to direct our next steps, to inform our instruction. In Module 3, you learned all about the types of assessment that can be used and the correct terminology that goes with the different types of assessment. But we talked about gathering data from two perspectives in the moment and to get a temperature reading. In the moment is gathering data that allows you to make immediate decisions on what to do to help that student or groups of students. This data can change the course of your instruction right then or at least within the following hours or days. Gathering data to get a temperature reading generally consists of more progress monitoring assessments where the data is gathered over certain periods of time and more thoroughly analyzed to help you make more major decisions regarding the course of instruction. Both are critical to meeting the needs of all students, so the key idea I hope you walk away with is gathering data is important, but the key is what you do with it. That wraps up the final stop and jot for Module 6. This is a great time to reflect on key elements covered to this point and how each connects to your classroom planning, instruction, and assessment. 